This is the Linear Algebra Lectures video series. You can find more information about this video as well as a link to the written textbook in the description below. Stick around to the end of the video to learn more about this video series and the associated teaching and learning tools I've created for it. Lecture 37, Inner Product, Length, and Orthogonality. Our objectives for this lecture are to compute the inner product or dot product of two vectors, find the length of a vector, normalize a vector, determine whether two vectors are orthogonal, and find a basis for the orthogonal complement of a subspace. In Rn, and especially in R2 and R3, we can think of vectors as arrows. We first discussed this back in lecture 6. We can apply geometric concepts such as length, distance, and perpendicularity to vectors. We define the inner product of two vectors in Rn, also called the dot product, and we write a dot symbol in between the two vectors, so u dot v, and that's defined by the formula u dot v equals u transpose times v. And what we're doing is we're taking the entries of u and multiplying them by the corresponding entries of v and adding up the results. Now, by this technical definition, this would give us a one by one matrix, but we're going to consider u dot v to be a scalar. So for example, if u is the vector negative two, one, five, and v is the vector six, negative seven, two, what is u dot v? Well, all we need to do is match up the entries of u with the corresponding entries of v, multiply them together, and add up the results. And in this case, that gives us the result negative nine. The dot product has some nice algebraic properties. For example, it's commutative, u dot v equals v dot u. We have a distributive property, u plus v dot w is u dot w plus v dot w. We have a compatibility property with scalar multiplication, c times u dot v is c times u dot v, and that's also equal to u dot c times v. And u dot u is always greater than or equal to zero, and it's only equal to zero if u is the zero vector. Let's take a look at that last property a little bit more closely u dot u is multiplying the entries of u by the corresponding entries of u, which means that we're squaring the entries of u and adding up the results. Because these entries are all real numbers, those squares will always be greater than or equal to zero, which means that their sum will be greater than or equal to zero, and only equal to zero if all of those numbers are zero. In other words, we have property four. Now we define the length of a vector, also sometimes called the norm of a vector, as the square root of the vector dotted with itself. So just like we talked about in property four on the previous slide, if we square the entries of the vector and add up the results, that's always going to be greater than or equal to zero. So the square root will always be defined for any vector, and the length of a vector will only equal zero if that vector is the zero vector. Our notation here is that we write double vertical lines around the vector. Now that's not 100% standard notation. You'll sometimes see just a single set of vertical lines around the vector, but for this course, we'll use the double lines. And also notice that this formula for length is the same as the distance formula from the origin to a point in Rn. Now, if we multiply a vector by a scalar, that's going to multiply its length by the absolute value of that scalar. Keep in mind that that scalar could be negative, and so that's why the norm of c times v is not just c times the norm of v, but rather the absolute value of c. If we divide a vector by a scalar, that's the same as multiplying the vector by 1 over that scalar, which will scale the vector in the similar way. Now, a vector of length 1 is called a unit vector, and we've already seen some unit vectors. The standard basis vectors, e1 through en, those are all unit vectors. And we're often going to want to normalize a vector, which means scale the vector up or down to make it be a unit vector. And the way that we do that is we multiply the vector by 1 over its length. So 1 over the norm of v times v gives us a unit vector that points in the same direction that v does. Let's try out a couple more examples. So now we have v is the vector negative 4, 5, 0, and w is the vector 1, negative 1, 2. And this question is asking us to find the length of v minus 3w. Well, before we can do that, we need to compute v minus 3w. So let's work that out. We get negative 7, 8, negative 6. And now the norm or length of v minus 3w is the square root of the sum of the squares of the entries of that vector. So the square root of negative 7 squared plus 8 squared plus negative 6 squared, which is the square root of 149. Part B of this problem asks us to find a unit vector that points in the same direction as v plus w. Another way to ask this would be to say, normalize v plus w. So we first compute v plus w, and we remember that what we need to do to normalize v plus w is take v plus w and divide it by its length. So the length of v plus w works out to be the square root of 29. So we're dividing v plus w by the square root of 29, which is the same as multiplying it by one over the square root of 29. And that gives us negative 3 over radical 29, 4 over radical 29, 2 over radical 29. 
And we can check that that vector is in fact a unit vector by finding its length, and here we see that the length is in fact 1. Now if we have two vectors in Rn, we might be interested in the distance between u and v. And what we mean by that is the distance between the heads of the vectors when those vectors are in standard position. So the way that we're going to do that is by calculating negative v and realizing that the vector u plus negative v, also known as u minus v, has the same length as the distance that we're looking for. So the distance between u and v can be computed by finding the norm of u minus v. Now we can say that two vectors in R2 or R3 are perpendicular if they form a right angle when they're placed in standard position. But that notion of angles doesn't generalize very well to dimensions higher than 3. So we're going to come up with another way to think about what it means for two vectors in R2 or R3 to be perpendicular. And here's our definition. Two vectors u and v are perpendicular when the distance between u and v is the same as the distance between u and minus v. Let's look at some pictures to see why this matches up with our definition using right angles. So here we have two vectors that are not perpendicular because the distance between u and v is not the same as the distance between u and minus v. So now we see u and a different vector v that are perpendicular because in this case the distance from u to v is equal to the distance from u to minus v. And notice if you look at that second picture that the vectors u and v are at right angles to each other. So we're going to generalize our notion of perpendicular to Rn by saying that two vectors u and v are orthogonal if the distance from u to v is equal to the distance from u to negative v. Or in other words, if the norm of u minus v is equal to the norm of u minus negative v. But this definition can be a little bit hard to use, so let's find a cleaner way to do this. What this really is saying is that the square root of u minus v dot u minus v is equal to the square root of u plus v dot u plus v. u minus negative v is u plus v. Now we're going to square both sides to get rid of the square roots. And now we're going to multiply out the left and the right hand sides. Remember that we have a distributive rule that works for dot products, so we're going to foil the left side and the right side. We're going to subtract u dot u from both sides and v dot v from both sides, canceling those out. Now we're going to realize that dot product is also commutative, which means that u dot v is equal to v dot u, so we can combine those terms together. And now we get negative 2 u dot v is equal to 2 u dot v. So if we subtract 2 u dot v from both sides, we get negative 4 u dot v equals 0. Multiplying both sides by negative 1 fourth gives us u dot v equals 0. And this is a much more convenient way to check for orthogonality in general. So our new definition is that if u and v are vectors in Rn, we say that u and v are orthogonal if u dot v is the scalar 0. And notice that we've been using this word orthogonal rather than perpendicular, and that's because the word perpendicular evokes the notion of a right angle, and right angles don't really make sense in higher dimensions, and so that's why we use this more generic term of orthogonal. Okay, let's try this definition out. Let's show that these two vectors in R4 are orthogonal. All we need to do is compute u dot v, so again we multiply the entries of u by the corresponding entries of v, adding up the results gives us 0, which matches our definition of orthogonal. Now we've already discussed the notion of column space of a matrix, which is just the span of the set of column vectors of that matrix. But we can also think of the rows of a matrix as being vectors, and so the row space of a matrix, written row A, is the span of the row vectors of that matrix. Now let's define the notion of a vector being orthogonal to a subspace. If H is a subspace of Rn and Z is a vector in Rn, we see that Z is orthogonal to H if z is orthogonal to every vector in h. So for example, in R2, if h is the subspace that is this line through the origin, and z is the vector that you see here, we can show that z is orthogonal to every vector in this subspace. So z is orthogonal to h. Now the orthogonal complement of h, written h with a little perpendicular sign, we read that as h perp. h perp is the set of all vectors that are orthogonal to h. So an example is that if h is a plane through the origin, that's the orange plane that you see here, then h perp would be a line through the origin that's perpendicular to that plane. And so any vector in h perp is orthogonal to any vector in h. So in this case, if we draw any vector in h perp and any vector in h, put them in standard position, they would be a right angle between them. And in general, if h is any subspace of Rn, then h perp is also a subspace of Rn. Now, there's a nice relationship between row spaces, column spaces, and null spaces and orthogonality that we can see here. The orthogonal complement of the column space of A is the null space of A transpose, and the orthogonal complement of the row space of A 
is the null space of A. So to illustrate this, let's consider an M by N matrix whose rows are U sub I transpose, and let's let X be a vector in Rn. So what we're doing here is we normally think of vectors as columns, but because I want to refer to the rows of this matrix, what I'm doing is I'm saying U I transpose to make those column vectors be row vectors. All right, so when we multiply A times X, what we're doing is going across the rows of our matrix and multiplying the entries by the entries of X and adding the results. That is exactly what we're doing when we take a dot product. And so the entries of AX are u1.x, u2.x, all the way up through um.x. And so when will that equal the zero vector? Well, that's going to equal the zero vector if and only if all of those dot products are zero. Or in other words, if and only if x is orthogonal to every row of A. Well, if x is orthogonal to every row of A, then x is in the orthogonal complement of the row space of A. And if ax equals 0, then x is in the null space of A. And so x is in the null space of A if and only if x is in the orthogonal complement of the row space of A. That means that those two sets are equal. And we can use a similar argument to show that the null space of A transpose is the orthogonal complement of the column space of A. So let's do one more example. So let's let v1 and v2 be the two vectors in R4 that you see here. And we'll let h be the span of those two vectors. And we want to find a basis for h perp. Well, what we're going to do is take those two vectors and put them in a matrix that we'll call A, so that H, being the span of those two vectors, is just the column space of this matrix. And what we just talked about is that the column space of A perp is the null space of A transpose. And we know how to find a basis for null spaces, so we'll form A transpose, row reduce it. That gives us the parametric form of the solution of A transpose x equals 0 that you can see here. Those two vectors in that basis, we'll call them u1 and u2, those form the basis for h perp that we're looking for. And we can check that both of the u's are orthogonal to both of the v's. And so what we've done is we've expanded this two vector basis for h to a four vector basis for r4, where some of the vectors in the basis are orthogonal to other vectors in the basis. We're going to expand this idea in the coming lectures. Thanks for watching this video lecture. You can find links to the other videos in this series and to the written textbook in the description below. If you're an instructor, you can contact me for more information about the over 300 online linear algebra homework problems that I've created for the free MyOpenMath platform.